who here watches South Park? Oh, about half the room, that's good. I asked this question to a room full of grant makers and nobody raised their hand. All right, so uh, if those of you who do watch South Park might recognize the reference in the title of my talk today, Solving the Underpants Gnomes Problem. The Underpants Gnomes were uh, seen in uh, an episode in season two of South Park um, when uh, uh, the, the, the boys go to, uh, to get help with a, um, a class project and, and um, they find that uh, these uh, gnomes are, are stealing their underpants. And so that basically the, the premise is that the underpants gnomes uh, come, come in the middle of the night, they steal your underpants, um, and they kind of uh, go to a, a giant warehouse underground somewhere. So the boys end up finding themselves uh, with the underpants gnomes at one point in the episode, and they uh, talk to them. Uh, and the underpants gnomes give them a presentation on the, the underpants gnomes business model, and they say that um, the, uh, the <laughs> phase one, you know, collecting the underpants is only phase one. And they say, well, what's, what's phase two? And there's this long silence, and the underpants gnomes say, well, phase three is profit! And so <laughs> they say, uh, um, okay, but what is phase two? And so they, they sort of uh, have a little, little, um, uh, a little powwow that, uh, that ends up in this um, beautiful PowerPoint presentation that shows phase, phase one as collecting the underpants, phase two, big gold silence and a question mark, and phase three, uh, profit. This, this seems ridiculous, but it's, it's actually a really good metaphor for, uh, for some of the things that we do. Um, you know, if, if in, in, in the arts field and in, in all sorts of fields, uh, you know, if I start a, uh, if I start an organization called Artists for World Peace and, and my next step is to uh, get a bunch of artists together to sort of stand in solidarity together, um, phase four of that, of that uh, strategy is going to be world peace, right? But what is, what is phase three exactly? How is this, this new organization going to advance that very complex goal? So the point is that a lot of what we do in the arts and elsewhere is uh, is uh, it, it requires including all the steps, and it's something that we that we don't always take care to do. Um, I wrote a a fairly lengthy blog post um, back in the spring called "Creative Placemaking Has an Outcomes Problem," uh, that sort of used this uh, this metaphor as a conceit, and. Um, the reason for, and I have to sort of pause and, and give credit to my boss, Adam Hutler, um, the executive director of Fractured Atlas, who came up with the underpants gnomes analogy, um, and I promptly uh, stole it from him and, and uh, made hay, so, so thanks, Adam. Um, the creative placemaking is, uh, most of you know, I'm sure, is sort of the, the latest buzzword um, in arts policy. Uh, the history of it is, um, it sort of grew out of writings by academic um, Richard Florida, uh, and uh, he wrote this book called The Rise of the Creative Class. Um, meanwhile, uh, there's a, a research group in, at the University of Pennsylvania called Social Impact of the Arts Project, um, who've also been uh, studying the connection between uh, arts activities and resources and uh, sort of local, local neighborhood uh, vibrancy and, and, uh, and prosperity and so forth. Um, while, uh, before she became deputy chairman of the, senior deputy chairman of the National Endowment for the Arts, um, Joan Shigakawa was a, uh, an associate director at the Rockefeller Foundation and, and Joan actually commissioned the Social Impact of the Arts Project to do a really groundbreaking um, series of studies looking at the connection, um, uh, looking at these, these connections between sort of neighborhoods and um, neighborhood re revitalization and the arts. Um, so now Joan, as I mentioned, is, uh, is the number two person at the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, the number one person is uh, Rocco Landesman, who uh, has uh, for a long time stated his interest in, you know, pretty much ever since he was um, nominated for the job, has stated his interest in, in um, sort of the role of the arts in, in 
uh, making downtowns uh, a more vibrant place. So that's where all this creative placemaking ended up coming from. Um, the NEA started a, uh, a grant program called Our Town, uh, and there was subsequently a collaboration of private funders um, that formed to create Art Place, um, whose director, Carol Coletta, is, uh, is actually based here in Chicago. So economic development in the arts is actually one of our, as arts research goes, is one of our better understood areas. Um, but there's a lot that we still don't know. So for example, what kinds of creative placemaking strategies are most successful in driving growth? What contexts are more, most hospitable to creative placemaking efforts? How can negative side effects such as gentrification be avoided or mitigated? And how can grant money make a difference in all of this? These are questions that it would be great to have the answer to, but we don't really know the answer to them. And my beef with our town and, and our place especially um, is that uh, now that we have, are in the process of making all of these grants to these creative placemaking projects all around the country, we have all of a sudden dozens and dozens of case studies that could collectively provide amazing insight into the answer to these, to these questions. Uh, and yet we're, we're not really studying them at all. Instead, we're investing in uh, indicator systems that don't really make any attempt, that very explicitly don't make any attempt to draw a causal connection between the grants made and the results achieved. Uh, and so why, why is this not doing this? Because it's not counting all the steps. And I'll give you, I'll give you an example of this. So this is one of our places uh, recently released vibrancy indicators. Uh, it's creative industry jobs. You can read the description up there. It um, measures uh, number of persons employed at businesses in arts, entertainment, media, and related industries. And um, the rationale is that vibrant neighborhoods have higher than average concentrations of these workers. Okay, you know, fair enough. I feel like uh, this, along with, with many of the, uh, the indicators mentioned, um, are a really good definition of what, what our place means by vibrancy. Um, but it doesn't say anything about the grants that Art Place is making uh, actually having anything to do with creating these jobs. It's just saying that if these jobs are there, then a neighborhood is more vibrant. Uh, so to give you an example of how this could be problematic, um, an all-volunteer effort, for example, would might create no jobs at all, but might certainly contribute to our sort of qualitative perception of vibrancy in a place. Similarly, a company could uh, decide to relocate to, uh, to the city or to the neighborhood for reasons completely unrelated to the grant. Uh, and in doing so, they would pump up this metric. And so if our place had uh, made a grant to a, um, uh, to a project in this neighborhood, it would sort of look like potentially the, um, the grant had had this effect on increasing creative industry jobs when in fact it had uh, nothing to do with that. So, uh, and I should say that, you know, our place is not claiming that this is the case, that, that there is a connection that you can draw between the vibrancy indicators and, um, uh, and the, the impact of their grants. But, and, and you know, it's, it's not, the point is not that the indicator systems are, are worthless or that we shouldn't be doing them at all, but they don't, they don't solve this, this problem that I'm talking about of having a sense of what, what is actually being accomplished by making these grants to these particular organizations. Um, and what will that mean? How, how can we choose the right grants in the future? So what would counting all the steps look like? Um, I've been working for uh, a couple of, of years now with an organization in Cincinnati called uh, ArtsWave. They used to be called the Fine Arts Fund. Uh, they're an 85-year-old uh, organization, um, as I said, based in Cincinnati, uh, originally formed essentially to be the, the sort of outsourced development department for uh, four major organizations in the city. Uh, and that over time expanded to eight, and now they actually fund uh, you know, something like 150 organizations in the, um, in the region. Um, so they raise all of their money to give it out again. It's like a united way, um, but for the arts. And uh, over time, giving the, give the trends were, were flat, um, and they had done a, a segmentation study showing that uh, three quarters of their donors actually had no transactional history with uh, what they call the big eight organizations in their, um, that get the bulk of the funding from, um, from 
uh, the group. And uh, so they realized that their audience for um, for this was really the the for their for soliciting donations for the arts it was really the general public, and it wasn't necessarily the patrons of the organizations that they were giving grants to, right? So they did this, uh, they commissioned this report called uh, the Arts Ripple Effect Report. It uh, came out a couple of years ago. And um, it, what it was was a, uh, an effort to go out into the community and just talk to regular people and have interviews with them. They had these things called talkback sessions, which were sort of very fancy um, surveys. There were also psychological tests in a way. Um, and uh, they called it a framing science study. Um, it's really interesting, and uh, the purpose was to try and assess uh, messages and frames that could be communicated to the public about to to members of the public about the arts, um, not to try and convince them of anything, to convince them that the arts are valuable or worth supporting, whatever, but to see what sort of resonated with what people already believe about the arts. Um, and they found that there were there were two messages that seem to carry more weight than the others when they did this. Um, and they called these, these ripples because they referred to, they both had to do with ways in which uh, supporting, ways in which arts activity sort of helps you even if you're not directly there, even if you're not directly participating in the arts activity. So the first one was a vibrant, thriving economy. Neighbors, neighborhoods are more lively, communities are revitalized, tourists and residents are attracted to the area, etc. And the second one was a more connected population. Diverse groups share common experiences, hear new perspectives, understand each other better, etc. cetera. So, uh, so this was all done before I had any involvement um, with the process. Uh, but the really amazing thing that happened next is that ArtsWave didn't just sort of, uh, or Fine Arts Fund at the time, didn't just sort of sit on this and say like, okay, well that's interesting, we're just sort of gonna keep doing what we've always been doing. Uh, they actually really took the research results seriously and they said, um, okay, well, this is, this is our constituency. They've told us basically what they want. So we are now going to completely change our organization, our mission, uh, our, the goals of our grant making to match with those two concepts, creating a, a vibrant, thriving economy and a more connected population uh, through supporting the arts. So where I got involved was um, uh, in when they, they sort of convened a, uh, a team, a, a task force called Measuring the Impact Team, uh, to, to start to think through what that would actually mean in practice, how, how you would set up a grant-making program to, uh, to, to serve those goals. So when I got, uh, when I got involved, I sort of immediately thought that a, a logic model approach would, would make sense. So um, I'm figuring probably some of you know all about logic models already. Some of you have probably never heard the term. So I'm just going to go through a very basic kind of definition of what they are. Um, a logic model has several key components. Um, and it's basically a way of, of visualizing, of articulating and visualizing a strategy. Uh, a key component is uh, the impact or goals, which are uh, sort of the highest, uh, at its highest level, what, you're, what you are trying to do. What is the end, the, the aspirational state at the end that you're trying to achieve. Um, activities are the strategies that you are taking to, um, to get that, to that place. And outcomes are kind of this interesting intermediate, uh, intermediate concept. Um, if, you were, if you're driving from uh, Chicago to Indianapolis, uh, Chicago might be the, the activity, Indianapolis might be the goal, and like Gary, Indiana would be an outcome. It's basically a, a waypoint um, and some kind of indicator to, to let you know that things are going well so far, um, and that, uh, but it's not sufficient. It's, you're not all the way there yet. So then a theory of change, uh, and you know, there, there is some confusion and, and inconsistency in the way that these terms are used, but the way that um, I tend to use uh, the term, uh, which is also called a program theory, depending on the, you know, who's using the term. Uh, it's, it's basically a way of arranging these concepts, the impacts, activities, and outcomes in a visual diagram uh, that uh, that shows the causal relationships between the different elements. Um, so 
here's a very simple version of a theory of change um, to kind of give you an idea of what I'm talking about. So if I decide that uh, you know I'm done with the whole arts thing and I, I'm, I've decided I want to go to law school, uh, you know we we can construct a, a very simple uh, program theory theory of change for that situation. Um, and, uh, and, and you know in order to in order to get into the law school of my choice, um, I've decided that I, you know, need to get a good test score on the LSAT. Um, so, you know, therefore I'm going to take a test prep class. So we've got, um, the impact is that my test score improves from where, what it was before. The activity is that I take, uh, I take the test prep class. Um, and what are the outcomes? Why do I think that taking the test prep class will actually improve my test score? Well, so one, one part of it is that if I, if I, maybe I just don't know the questions well enough. So if I learn how to answer the, the test questions, I will presumably do better on the test. But it, there might be another element too. It could be that I, uh, the, the test makes me nervous. And when I'm nervous, I don't, I don't do as well on test taking. So, uh, so taking the test prep class might help me to feel more confident about taking the test, which will then also improve my, improve my performance. And you can see that there's also an arrow between outcome one and outcome two. If I know more about how to answer the test questions better, that will probably improve my, cons uh, my confidence as well, independent of anything that's going on with the class. So, is a, like I said, this is a very simple sort of arrangement. Is ever, does everybody get this? Everybody comfortable with this concept? Okay. So, uh, this is Art Place's theory of change that they, that they published. It's um, a little bit hard to read, um, but Art Place is at the beginning of it. Uh, this concept of vibrancy is, uh, is the next part, and this is sort of the real crux of um, the way that Art Place organizes um, and talks about its work. Um, and they actually say that there are three components to vibrancy, um, which are really hard to read, so I'll try and read them for you. Um, it's people, value, and activities. So all three of these uh, are components of vibrancy. When you have vibrancy of a, in a place, you have quality of place, and then uh, a quality of place leads to attraction and retention of talent which then in turn leads to economic development. Fair enough, uh, but not that much more complicated than what we just saw, right? All right, this is a, a fun little logic model that I created um, in a sort of another post. Uh, somebody responded to, uh, uh, to me ex expressing skepticism about logic models and said that uh, the joy that she feels in the, uh, Minneapolis's May Day Festival could never be expressed in a logic model. And I said, that's not true. I'll do it for you right now. And so I made this uh, little diagram in about an hour using exclusively words from her blog posts or her um, column that she used to describe her experience at the May Day Festival um, to sort of prove the point that if you can describe something, you can create a logic model out of it. Um, and so, you know, she, she cited these elements of giant puppets, food, music, dancing, um, you know, children running up everywhere and random weirdos uh, and, you know, it, it making her, uh, uh, restoring her faith in humanity. All right. So this is what we came up with for Arts Wave. Um, so you can see that this goes into quite a bit more depth. Um, and uh, so I'm not going to bore you with, with every detail of this, obviously, but I do want to take you through um, one element of it, because we looked before at uh, the vibrancy indicator of art place um, uh, that had to do with creative industries. And so the creative industries are also mentioned in the arts wave theory of change. Um, this is the top, top right corner you can see of the model, you can see the, in the green, the sort of darker green um, box, vibrant economy and neighborhood. So this is one of the two goals that, um, that ArtsWave had set for itself. Um, and uh, there are these little bands kind of at the far right, and um, the one in sort of this beige color uh, towards the bottom says, the arts contribute to a thriving regional economy. So th these are sort of denote clusters of outcomes that are themed in some way. So if we look at the thriving regional economy, there are two things that lead to the thriving regional economy. One is that, uh, or, or sort of make up 
the components of that concept. One is the, the region builds on its creative industry base, uh, again, getting to the creative industries, and businesses have a high quality employee base. Okay, so, and that, that sort of matches with the talent retention um, concept of, uh, of art place. And then we have a regional development model. Um, and the, the thing that I want to point your attention to is that it um, talks explicitly about the, uh, the way in which a region becomes a place that people want to move to or want to stay in. Um, there's, uh, the region is, is differentiated, first of all, from other sort of competitor regions uh, that people might choose to live to, or live in, or move to instead, uh, or visit. Um, the region draws national and international attention. The, the region is a place of destination, uh, and the reputation of, so actually the order, sorry, is, is the region is differentiated, the region draws national and international attention, the reputation and the profile of the region is increased, which leads to the region becoming a place of destination, which was a term of art um, coined by one of our task force members. Uh, so how does that happen? These are all, um, if, you, if you look at the, uh, the colors of these boxes, you'll notice that most of them are either blue or have a blue outline. If go back to the, the broad, the whole picture, at the bottom of this, you'll see that um, the blue color corresponds to sector outcomes. We've, we've separated this concept of outcomes into sector outcomes and then grantee outcomes. So we're, and the way that we're thinking about this is that sector outcomes are, cons are, are, are outcomes that have to do with, with the entire ecosystem. Uh, no one individual organization or grantee is going to be responsible for them. But instead, they are the result of many organizations and many grants acting in concert together. Whereas grantee outcomes are things that an individual organization can be held accountable to. So getting back to this concept of um, the regional development model, we have the region is differentiated here. So how does the region become differentiated? Well, according to the theory, um, it's a little bit hard to see, but this, this outcome of extraordinary cultural experiences are available is the way in which the region becomes um, differentiated. And we have a very specific definition of extraordinary um, that we're using here. We're, we're talking literally about experiences that are out of the ordinary, that you wouldn't be able to experience every day, um, either because they, are, they draw a national, they have a national or international profile, uh, perhaps because they reflect something special and unique about that region. Um, so they're not available in other places besides that place. Um, perhaps because they're not otherwise available in the region. So, you know, if there's, um, you know, not a Thai restaurant in a town and a Thai restaurant all of a sudden opens up, then that sort of in and of itself becomes extraordinary. So, uh, so this is the way in which we're explicitly drawing the connection between what individual grantees might do and uh, the impact that they might create. And so what we would hold, what Artswave would then hold uh, individual grantees responsible for is, is those experiences. Are those experiences available and are they happening? It's then up to fate in a way to kind of, uh, to make the leap to, um, to the region being differentiated relative to its peers because the, an individual organization is never going to be able to have control over that specifically. Or I shouldn't say never be able to, but in, it's a rare, a rare situation in which they would, would be able to make that happen. So anyway, um, that's all a little bit technical, but I just wanted to give you a sense of sort of the, the, what's different about this approach. Um, oh, and before I get into that, um, so this isn't all just theory. We are um, actually developing a uh, you know, currently a framework in, in which to um, have these concepts be measured. Uh, and so we've gone, started down the path of identifying data sources that can be plugged into all of these. And we'll, of course, have to make decisions about what we're actually going to try and collect data on and what we're not. Um, but, uh, you know, that, that process will sort of add meat to these bones from a measurement standpoint. So what does this do? Uh, one thing is that it, it 
embraces complexity. It honors reality by not oversimplifying the world. And it also, it also says that things that are hard to measure are not okay to forget about just because they're hard to measure, which is all too often a uh, kind of a compromise that, um, that people make for the sake of feasibility. It also says, um, sorry, the other thing that's kind of different about it is that there's a real integration between data and strategy. This, is, this all is a research motivated initiative. You know, Artswave didn't, didn't sort of start out by saying, um, okay, well we want to make this change and this is the direction in which we're going to change it so we're going to you know, sort of commission a study and then go from there. They uh, approached this with an extremely open mind, um, really listened to what they were hearing from their constituents and then, uh, and then put it into action accordingly. This new information that the, the framework sort of, uh, the, the, the new information that will result from the framework guides decision making at all levels. So it's actually, you know, it, it bubble, it trickles down from the grand strategy of the entire organization to decisions about individual grants. Um, to, because each one of them can be analyzed um, within this context of, you know, does it fit? Does it fit within this strategy of making grants to support cultural clusters and how are we going to evaluate um, the extent to which that strategy is being fulfilled. Um, and it's also adaptable to change. You know, these are, these are living documents. I don't think any of us would claim that we've, you know, kind of solved the, the problem or have figured out all the answers with this. Um, but the sort of, the building blocks are in place to, to actually figure out whether whether this strategy is working. And if it's not working, not to say, okay, well, it's not working, we should blow it up and try something completely different, but to actually dil drill down and try and isolate um, the specific things about it that are not working so that those can be tweaked. So why is this, this integration between data and strategy important? Well, I think that research is only valuable insofar as it influences decisions. And this is why I think that logic models are awesome. They are a visual de depiction of strategy. And there is no such thing as strategy without cause and effect. So think about that for a second. Our lives can be understood as, as a set of circumstances and decisions. We make decisions to try and improve our circumstances and sometimes the circumstances of those around us. Every decision that you make is based on a prediction, whether explicitly articulated or not, about, about the results of that decision. So every decision therefore carries with it a certain degree of uncertainty. And this uncertainty can be expressed in other ways an, as an assumption about the way that the world works and the context in which your decision is being made. And these assumptions are distinguished from known facts. So if you can reduce the uncertainty associated with your assumptions, the chances that you'll make the right decision or the optimal decision will increase, right? So how do you, how do you reduce that uncertainty? The answer, of course, is through research. And I'm, I'm thinking about research very broadly. You know, when you, when you uh, look up the, what the Weather Channel says about whether it's gonna rain tomorrow, that's research, your information gathering. Studying what has happened in the past is likely to inform what is likely to happen, sorry, it can inform what is likely to happen in the future. Studying what has happened in other contexts can inform what is likely to happen in your context. And studying what is happening now can tell you a lot about whether your assumptions are right on the money or off by a mile. So if we establish that research is the crucial missing link, the problem is that research and practice in our field are frequently disconnected in really problematic ways. And I think that five issues in particular are getting in the way. But can we uh, just appreciate my amazing graphic design skills for a second? <laughs> All right, supply and demand. Uh, the first issue is capacity. Supply and demand um, applies just as much to research as it does to artists. We, um, uh, those of you who sort of follow discussions in the field probably know that um, our chairman of the NEA, uh, Rocket Landisman, uh, has kind of stirred up a big um, to-do last year talking about uh, supply and demand in the arts, and he said that 
he said that uh, demand is, you're never going to increase demand, so you might as well start thinking about reducing supply, talking about artists and the, sort of all the stuff that's available um, to, uh, uh, to people to consume. Well, um, well, I would hold that the same thing is true um, on the research side. There are way more studies than a normal arts professional can possibly fully process uh, in, my, in my observation and experience. Um, I wish I could tell you how many research reports are published in the arts each year, but nobody knows. That's how sort of disconnected and, and dysfunctional our field is that, you know, we just don't, we don't have information about this stuff. Um, to get, you know, a little bit of an idea, I went back, so at, uh, at my blog, Create Equity, I, I publish a, a roundup called Around the Horn. Uh, and oftentimes when I hear about a new research report, I'll just put a bullet point in and say, hey, somebody's published a new research report. So I went back over a period of a year and, uh, and counted, uh, it was last year, 2011, and I counted uh, all the different publications that I'd mentioned just in those bullet points. And remember, this is totally reactive. You know, this is not me going out and you know, trying to find as many research reports as possible. Um, but I, I counted at least 41 relevant publications um, that had, you know, been uh, published in that in that past year, um, and which is a tiny fraction, I'm sure, of the total output. So if you know if these were 41 blog posts, okay, fine, wouldn't be such a big deal. But the problem is that research reports are long, and arts professionals are busy. So to give you an example, um, uh, one of the one of the uh, sort of features on Create Equity is something called the Arts Policy Library, um, whose purpose is really to sort of take some of these studies and, and interpret them for, for uh, analyze and interpret them for a lay audience, uh, for people who don't have time to read the whole thing. Um, and another thing that I do on Create Equity is something called the, the writing, Create Equity Writing Fellowship. Um, I have people apply to become a contributor to the site, uh, and write for it. And one of the requirements of, the, of all the Creative Equity Writing Fellows is that they have to write up uh, an arts policy library piece um, at the end. So at the end of their, as, as part of their term as a Creative Equity Writing Fellow. So at the end of the fellowship, I always send them a, a survey to, um, to just get for my own benefit, get a sense of how long they spent on uh, writing each article. And consistently, I've had uh, a total of eight people now um, writing uh, who completed completed uh, arts policy library pieces for the site. Again, this is analysis of one research study. And consistently across all of these different people, it takes them between 30 and 80 hours of their time to really thoroughly dig into study, um, take notes on it, write it up, uh, and, and sort of do it justice in that way. For one study. So I, I, I identified 41, <laughs> you know, going back through... Um, Looking at the uh, at the around the horn posts, um, like I said, it's I'm sure it's a it's a tiny percentage, um, and another you know one of the reasons why I'm sure, sure it's a tiny percentage is because uh, a lot of the research that's published in the arts we as a field don't even really know about. Um, there's and and a big part of the reason for that is because there's almost no connection between academia and practitioners um, when it comes to arts research. There is not sort of a, uh, a specific kind of defined field at most universities of, around arts research. Um, so it's in all sorts of different departments. Um, unless the academic, you know, an academic may publish a, uh, uh, you know, a, a, a journal article or something, um, but unless unless the academic was commissioned to do their work by a foundation, realistically, we in the arts, our practitioners, never hear about it. Um, the other problem is that, uh, there, you know, if, if an academic publishes an article in a journal, it's behind a firewall. You need a, a subscription to read that journal, and most, most arts organizations don't have subscriptions to journals. And if there is just one journal, maybe, um, you know, we could get arts organizations to subscribe to all of those, but, you know, they're there are half a dozen, 10, 20 maybe, that could potentially be relevant. Um, you know, after, uh, so one of the very first arts policy, li uh, arts policy library pieces that I wrote was about Richard Florida's Rise of the Creative Class. Um, in response, he pointed me to a study in two parts by two Dutch researchers. It's one of the most helpful resources I've ever come across about creative class theory, and I've never heard anyone mention it other than me. 
It just speaks to the lack of visibility for it for this work. Um, another challenge is interpretation. Research reports are written with the, research, the researcher's voice and agenda. Um, and that's especially true of executive summaries and press releases, which is often all anybody reads, I will tell you from experience. Um, a very common agenda uh, is to convey that the research, so, you know, they, they have a voice and agenda. A very common agenda is to convey that the researcher knows what he or she is talking about. Um, and another common agenda is, you know, if they were sort of hired or commissioned to do the research is to ensure repeat business um, from the client. Uh, but, you know, research varies widely in quality. Um, there's, no, there's no certification process. Pretty much anybody can call themselves a researcher. Um, but, you know, it's not just a question of, like, who has the best credentials or whatever. I mean, what I've seen is that even professionals sometimes, uh, you know, make mistakes. Uh, they might pursue questionable methods, um, overlook obvious holes in their logic. Um, and the reality of any given research effort is that it's, it's usually not either brilliant or terrible. Um, Almost all of the research studies that I've read and analyzed as part of this process um, have had, you know, some things that have been really admirable and, and even potentially groundbreaking about them, um, and other things that really are not as good um, and, you know, uh, sort of problematic, uh, um, sort of by various uh, by various standards. So, uh, but that's but that's a very nuanced view, and many arts professionals lack expertise to properly evaluate research reports. You'd be amazed at how many people in this field lack even tra uh, lack training in even basic statistics. Like they've never taken a basic statistics course, um, and I know this because that was me before I went to business school. I, I actually literally had never taken a course in statistics. I had never taken a course in economics. Um, I had basically no quantitative training whatsoever, um, and I was doing fine um, in the arts. I wasn't doing research uh, related stuff, but uh, you know, there's there's not really any reason why. Uh, an arts professional would feel like they need to have this training, um, you know, unless their their work kind of intersected with it in some way. Um, so, the fourth issue is objectivity. Uh, you know, I talked about this a little bit already from the researcher's standpoint, but also from it's also an issue potentially from the standpoint of the organizations that are commissioning the research or, or um, asking for the research. Fundamentally, research is about uncovering the truth, but sometimes people don't want to know the truth. Advocacy goals often precede research. How often have you heard somebody in your line of work say, we need research to back this up? That statement is sort of antithetical to the whole idea of research. Um, research to studies that are conducted to affirm decisions that have already been made uh, go against the way that logic models are done, for example. When we do a logic model, we start from the goal, the goal that you want to achieve, and you work backwards to try and understand how that goal will be best achieved by the, whatever activities. Um, we work backwards to understand what activities you should undertake to best achieve that goal. Um, but a lot of times what happens instead is the activities are set. You already know what your program is. You already know the strategy that you're going to take, and you just need something to say that this is the right strategy. Um, this is, here are a bunch of bad but common reasons to do a research project, to prove your own value rather than to assess your own value, to increase your organization's prestige, to advance an ideological agenda. We saw this a lot in the election, right? And to provide political cover for a decision. In my opinion, the only good reason to do research, the only good reason, is to try to find out something you didn't know before. If that's not the reason, then you're not doing it. You're not doing it right. Um, the last issue, uh, sorry, the fifth issue is, uh, is fragmentation. The worst, problem, the worst part of the problem that I just described is that it drives what research gets done and what research doesn't get done namely the gaps in research. There's no common research agenda that's been adopted by the entire field, which is a shame because collective knowledge is, is pretty much the definition of a public good. If I increase my own knowledge, it's very easy for me to increase your knowledge too, right? But we don't often operate in that way. Um, and the practical consequences of this are severe. We have a, we have a concentration of research 
again, just sort of from observation from my perch here, um, there's a concentration of research using res readily available data sources, um, which ignores the fact that uh, the creation of new data sources often may be more valuable. Um, there's a concentration of research in geographic geographies and communities that can afford it because people don't often pay for research that's not about them, right? But you, you think of all these rural communities, for example, in this country that don't have foundations paying for this kind of thing. Um, and, uh, you know, and they don't, they don't get the same kind of attention from, uh, from the field as, as places like here in Chicago. You get a concentration of research serving narrow interests, discipline specific, organization specific, methodology specific. And this is, this is my biggest pet peeve. Research is almost never intentionally replicated. Everybody's reinventing the wheel over and over again, uh, studying the same stuff in, in slightly different ways. Uh, even when, when research is replicated, oftentimes, you know, if a, a funder or a client is paying for it, um, they want to they'll want to customize it in ways that you know make make it more relevant to them. But it also reduces the external validity of the replication of the research. So it's because it's it's not as comparable as it once was. Um, you know, the Arts Rebel Effect report is a great example. Uh, this is a report that is now guiding tens of millions of dollars, uh, ten million to ten million dollars a year, basically in grant in arts grant funding. Um, but you know, it's ultimately a small study um, involving several hundred people. Are, are those attributes universal? The, the the attitudes that they that they expressed when when um, you know talking about the the ways in which the arts make sense to them are they universal or are they unique to Cincinnati? We don't know. We won't know until somebody does that study again somewhere else. Um, and who knows when that's going to happen. And then finally, the last issue is uh, about allocating resources. You know, everybody knows there's a trend towards more and more data collection at the level of the organization or artists. Um, organizations, especially of small ones, complain all the time about being expected to do audience surveys, uh, submit owner's paperwork, etc. And I agree. Um, you might be surprised to hear that, but you know, when, when organizations, uh, when you're talking about organizations that have small budgets, they have no expertise um, to to sort of do this kind of work, and the funder who's who's asking for information from them is not providing any assistance um, in terms of capacity or technical assistance or so forth to help them, uh, you know, do do research well. Um, you know, just take a risk. I feel like if you make a small grant that that goes bad, so what? You're out a few thousand dollars. The sun will rise tomorrow. Uh, as an example of this, um, I was I served on a, a grant panel recently, and I, I enjoyed the experience, and, and I'm glad I did it. Um, but there's one aspect of it that I think is relevant to all of this. Um, you know, there were several seven panelists. Um, uh, and we were originally eight, actually, and we were all from out of town. Each of us spent, I'd say, roughly 40 hours um, reviewing all the grant applications that were submitted in advance. And then we all came to town, and we spent two full days in person uh, together reviewing these grants more and talking about them and scoring them. We did this for 64 applications uh, for up to $5,000 each. And in the end, 92% of them were funded. So consider this as a research exercise. You know, the decision is who to give grants to and how much. The data is the grant applications. The researchers are the review panel. What uncertainty is being reduced by this process? How much worse would the outcome have been if we just taken all the organizations, put them in Excel, assigned a random number generator, and distribute the, the dollars randomly up to five thousand dollars per organization. How much worse that would that have been? Um, you know, and I'm not saying this to, to make fun of this particular organization, uh, you know, or single them out because honestly, it's not uncommon, right? The way that we the uh, the procedures that we have in place to um, to evaluate grants at this level, uh, the level of a few thousand dollars. But then, if you go back to our place um, and think about the situation there. In their first round of grants, they had theoretically thousands of projects to choose from. Uh, with, and they gave grants up to a million dollars for creative placemaking projects. 
Uh, but there was no review process. They just picked, picked projects to award grants to. So there's a bit of a mismatch sometimes in the way that we, uh, in the, in the uh, strategies that we use to, to sort of decide what, uh, how we're allocating resources. Um, there's a concept called expected value of information from a, a really wonderful book called How to Measure Everything. Anything, sorry. How to Measure Anything by uh, Douglas Hubbard. Um, and it's a way of taking into account how much information matters to your decision-making process. Um, and uh, Hubbard makes a couple or, or shares a couple of specific findings from, from his work in the book um, uh, from working with as a consultant with lots, in lots of different settings. Uh, and he's, he found that um, most variables have an information value of zero. So in other words, we can study them all we want, but in the end, whatever, whatever the truth is, is not going to change what we do um, because it doesn't, it doesn't matter enough in the sort of grand scheme of things. And he also found that the things that matter the most, the things that really would change our decision if we, if we knew the answer to them, um, often aren't studied, you know, either because it, we perceive them as being too hard to measure. So we need to ask ourselves, as we kind of go through this, how new information would actually change the decisions that we make. So there's lots and lots of untapped potential in arts research, and, but it, it remains untapped um, because of all these, these issues that I've just talked about. So how could we, how could we do something about it? Um, first, I think we need a major field building effort for arts research. Uh, connecting researchers with each other through a virtual network or, or community of practice would, would help a lot. Um, also, just having all the research in one place, all of it in one place, uh, where even if you know it's behind some kind of copyright firewall, um, at least to have the link to it, to have the, the citation, um, to know that it exists. Um, the good news is that the National Endowment for the Arts is already making some moves in this direction. Um, they uh, published a, a, a monograph uh, a couple of months ago called How Art Works. The major focus of it was uh, something they call, they're calling a system map for sort of like how, how the arts work, um, given the title. Uh, but at the end of that document, there's actually a pretty detailed research agenda for the NEA, not for the entire field, um, that uh, says over a period of, of the next five years what the NEA is planning to do, what the, the Office of Research and Analysis in the NEA is planning to do. And two of the things that they mention are exactly the two things that I talked about, um, uh, the virtual network and, uh, and sort of a, a sort of centralized database of research. Um, the new field, so this new field that we're building should be guided by a national research agenda that is collaboratively generated and directly tied to decisions of consequence. Um, so the research agenda that I mentioned, that's part of how art works, uh, the missing piece there is the tie to actual decisions. Um, you know, they kind of have categories instead. Oh, this is some research about cultural participation. Well, it's, you know, it's not enough for research to be about something. Research should serve some purpose. What do we actually need to know in order to do our jobs better? And it's not so much that, you know, that research that they would fit into that bucket, like doesn't, you know, can't, can't have that purpose, but it's just that um, it's not being articulated right now um, in, uh, you know, in the way that they, in the way that they talk about it. Um, I think it would be helpful if researchers uh, spent less time generating new research and more time critically evaluating each other's research. Uh, we need to generate lots more discussion about the research that's already produced. It's the only way that it's actually going to enter the public consciousness. And each time we, feel, we fail to do that, we're missing out on opportunities to increase knowledge. Um, and it would also increase our collective standards, you know, about methodology, about logic, and so forth, if, we, if we're engaging in a healthy debate about the research that gets out there. Um, but in order for this to happen, you know, realistically, field incentives need to change. Um, and, you know, it, it has to be the case that analyzing existing research would need to be seen as equally prestigious and worthy of funding, because um, in the end, that's what drives a lot of this, uh, as creating a new study. I'd also prefer if, you know, the people who are evaluating each other's research are not their direct competitors. <laughs> um, but honestly, I'll take what I can get at this point. Um, you know, 
conflict of interest is all, always a, uh, a consideration. Um, every research in effort should take into account the expected value of the information it will produce. So consider the risk in, involved in various types of grants made. What are you trying to achieve by giving out lots of small grants if that's what you're doing? Maybe measure that what what the overall strategy is trying to achieve rather than the success or failure of each grant. And the general sense that I have, you know, and, and this is really getting more into sort of hypothesis territory, but I, I, I feel like uh, research on grant strategy is woefully underfunded, whereas research on specific grants, if you think about, if you're sort of inclusive about the definition of research and including these kinds of, you know, panel processes that I was talking about, um, is probably overfunded. You know, we probably worry more than we need to about individual grants, but we don't worry as much as we should about the uh, about whether the the ways in which we're making decisions about which grants to support are the right are the right ways to do that. And then finally, oh. oops. Finally, we should, be, we should be open sourcing research and working as a team. And what do I mean by this? Sharing not just finished reports and, and finished products and final reports, but plans, data, raw data, methodologies as well, seeking multiple uses and potential partners at every point for the work that we're doing. This would make our work so much more effective by allowing, to le allowing us to leverage each other's strengths. We're not all experts at everything, you know, as much as as sometimes we might like to think we are. Um, it would cut down on duplicated effort and free up expensive people's time uh, to do work that really moves the field forward instead of move work that you know, is sort of necessitated by the, by the structure of our field as it exists now. So that's all I got. Um, it's a whole bunch of hurrying, <laughs> but I hope it was interesting. And I would love to, uh, so, hear any questions or comments or reactions that you guys to have to some of these thoughts um, about the state of our research field and um, the extent to which all this matters or doesn't. <laughs> Uh, so the question, which is a fantastic one, is do I have any predictions about how long it might take to create this perfect world um, in which we're all, um, you know, running around in Pollyannas and, and uh, working together and, and so forth? Um, so, uh, uh, no. <laughs> um, I think it might take a while. I think aspects of it will, t will take longer than others. Um, there, you know, are some, there are some parts of what I've been recommending and, and talking about that are already kind of in the works. Like, for example, that um, the stuff that the NEA is doing. Um, let's see what else. I, I think that um, the, uh, you know, having more discussion about research that's already, that's already existing is something that I, I'm trying to contribute to through, um, through my blog and, you know, I, I, I expect that it will be an increasing trend just as sort of um, more people get involved in the field, more people sort of start to contribute to the conversation in this way. Um, I think that, uh, you know, developing, things like developing a national research agenda um, would take more time, but having the infrastructure in place, the communications infrastructure, um, would help a lot with that. Um, and the NEA has already indicated a willingness to sort of take on a leadership role in, in agenda setting. Um, and I think that uh, with, the, with the additional sort of uh, um, infrastructure in place, it would, it would um, be possible to, to sort of take that further. Um, the stuff about open sourcing research and working as, you know, as, as team members, I think that's going to be really hard. Um, and the, the reason for that is because the whole way that, the reason for it essentially is that people need to get paid at the end of the day. Um, everybody, you know, in this field needs to make a living. Um, and so we need to figure out a way to make sure that happens without um, setting up people to be 
uh, kind of in competition with each other needlessly. Now, you know, I'm not trying to say that like there, there's no place for competition in research, um, you know, or that it could never be valuable. But I really do see a lot of this sort of duplication of effort um, that I was talking about, and uh, and it's I think it's difficult to. I think it's just very, it's not even because people are like trying to box each other out or whatever, but it's because um, it's just really easy to fall into that way of working without this collaborative infrastructure already in place where people are talking to each other all the time about, um, you know, about their plans, about what should be done on behalf of the field and so forth. So I think that once, once I think the communication infrastructure is the most important element of it because so much of the other stuff really sort of depends on that being there. Um, it really can't succeed without a really strong backbone of, of communication between people who are working in this field um, on the research side and people who would be consumers of the research really having the ability to connect with each other and share um, what's needed and also what's possible. Yeah. Uh, it was really interesting to hear you mention this Dutch researchers in mm -hmm. the industries. And I wonder if you could comment a little bit about international research in the arts and um, what's happening in the, in the larger field. And is that Dutch study written in English and sort of the language issue? And yeah. Um, what are other countries doing? So that study, those studies are in English. Um, uh, which is, I definitely don't read Dutch, so that was how I was able to, uh, to, um, to read them. Uh, you know, the, honestly, I, I don't even know a lot about what's going on internationally. It's, you know, sort of another symptom or example of how, um, you know, we don't even have a good handle on the research studies that are produced in the U.S. Um, and I think there's so much potential for us uh, to learn from other countries, from other countries to learn from us, and the communication uh, sort of channels that exist right now on the sort of research side are, are virtually non-existent. Or, well, it's, it's not so much that they're non-existent, but they're they're extremely informal. There are relationships that um, you know that exist between individuals um, who might have worked together previously or met at a conference or something like that. Um, you know, again, like academic journal articles may have a, an international readership, but it's going to be very small, um, and so. Uh, it's it's extremely informal and just not um, uh, not robust at this point. Yeah. Do you see models uh, elsewhere in other sectors for building more robust communication systems? That is a really good question. So the question is, uh, do I see models in other sectors for um, for building this more robust um, these more robust lines of communication? Um, that's a really great question, and uh, one that I wish I had the answer to. Um, and uh, I think that it's it's probably a um, an area that we could invest productively in some research. <laughs> um, I think your hand was up first. Uh, so I'm sorry. Could you repeat it? Uh, why do you think the expected value of our information is so often zero? What pitfalls mm -hmm. are we falling into when we're choosing what to research? So, so the question is, why do I think that the expected value of our research is so often zero, and what pitfalls are we falling into when we're um, choosing what to research? So, um, so this is this was something from from the book, and um, you know it's not an analysis that I've done myself, so I'm just sort of going off of his word um, of it. But um, uh, but my understanding of what Hubbard was saying in the book is that um, there is uh, so so what happens a lot of times is that we we look for a lot of it comes from the fact that we look first to data instead of looking to questions, thinking through the questions that we want to have answered. Um, we, we think about, so, okay, well, what, what do we already have that we could, what, do, what data do we already have, and, and let's try and find a way to use it. Um, and so, for example, he made a distinction in the book between um, sort of like tracking visits, um, you know, instead of tracking improvement in, uh, like a, in the case of a nonprofit, um, tracking improvement um, in the lives of the people who, who came. So it's easier to measure the visits, right? Because it's just something that you build into the administrative structure. Excuse me. Um, you know, I mean, I think that uh, 
but the other thing, the other thing though, um, is that Hubbard talks in the book about a really helpful, um, I mean, he talks about this expected value of information. And it's not just this sort of, you know, um, it's not just this conceptual uh, notion. It's, it's actually a method that you can use to calculate what the value of that information is. Um, and it's, it comes from the, a field called decision analysis, which is super interesting. And essentially what it involves is making a lot of estimates about um, potential outcomes for different, you know, different decisions or different, um, you know, unknowns uh, that are that are ahead of you. Um, and so this is a step that I think most um, most arts professionals and even people outside the arts sort of don't take the time to uh, uh, to take. And you know, often probably because this decision analysis is not a field that's extremely widely studied. Um, but I think it's it's really you know potentially really relevant um and and so i'm trying to just think how to like explain it really briefly but basically what it involves is saying like okay so um i'm going to let's take the uh decision about whether to take an umbrella um when i'm going to work tomorrow uh you know i check i check weather.com but you know weather.com isn't always accurate right um and so uh and there's going to be some sort of inconvenience um, to me by taking the umbrella. I'd rather not take my umbrella if I don't have to. So there's a way to calibrate, you know, what is the, the forecast, given the, the error rate of, um, of weather.com's forecasts, you know, what is sort of the, the love and what and my tolerance for risk for um, that, you know, I'll be caught in the rain. How much would that suck to be caught in the rain without an umbrella? And how much would it suck to be carrying my umbrella around with me all day um, but never even having to use it. Um, so weighing those two things against each other, um, as well as the, you know, uh, the, the possibility that the forecast could be wrong, there's a way to calculate what is the, the sort of minimum um, percentage of rain in the forecast where I should actually take my umbrella. Um, so that's like obviously a really trivial example, but you, could, you can imagine that being applied to decisions of real import. Right, um, you know, is this is this million dollar grant going to work? The um, uh, sorry, I'll just say this one thing, and I'll, I'll let somebody else ask a question. But um, but uh, I was reading recently about this um, this uh, kind of big initiative called One Laptop Per Child um, that it was started by an MIT professor. Um, you know, super super ambitious. They they built and then now are distributing laptops in classrooms or low you know classrooms in developing countries around the world. Uh, so Peru ordered two hundred million dollars worth of these laptops, and there was a study done basically saying that it wasn't worth the investment. And um, the reason that sort of seemed to be the most um, salient was that. Um, there wasn't like basically they would just sort of drop off the, the laptops and not train the teachers to use them, not train interns to train the teachers to use them. And, you know, these people who had never seen a laptop before, a lot of times wouldn't wouldn't know what to do with it. And um, they might sort of uh, like open it up. You know, there there was buggy, didn't always work very well. Um, and so then you have all this expensive equipment sitting in a corner, not getting used, things are basically the status quo. So that's sort of, that's an, that's an example of where, you know, um, it seems that the risk of that happening wasn't really taken into account before these decisions were made to spend this gigantic amount of money um, making this, this program happen. I saw other hands earlier. Uh, and back. Yeah, so I actually I actually think that it's possible to accomplish a lot of this without a lot of extra, without spending a lot more resources than we're doing now. Uh, I think it's really more about finding ways to 
direct those resources in a smarter way rather than just in, just a massive increase. Um, you know, a massive increase wouldn't hurt because, <laughs> um, you know, one of the things that uh, we always run up against in this field is that there's there's never enough money to do do the project as well as you would want to. Um, you know, almost almost always uh, the case. Uh, you know, in the and we talk a lot about sort of methodological shortcuts that we take in this field. Um, you know, national um, uh, the the so yeah, we had a um, we were talking to somebody from the from the pharmaceutical industry who was saying that they um, they would readily invest a billion dollars in R and D to a drug that might never work, right? But it's just built into their business model to. Um, you know, to invest this kind of money in um, in the research, and of course, you're going to get more robust studies um, when you can when you can throw that kind of money at it. Um, but you know, and you still you still have things that go wrong, right? Drugs that that um, that kill people instead of uh, instead of doing what they're supposed to. So um, so you're never going to eradicate uncertainty completely. And I think that the concept of value of information is the one that. Um, that can be our compass when thinking about this, because it really is a way to sort of make sure that you're, that you're measuring the right things. Are you measuring the things that matter to you know to what you're doing? If you're if you have a grant program, for example, that's giving out twenty million dollars a year to a local community or something, I would think that making sure that you're making the right grants and that they're going to the right places is worth you know, investing. I don't know, maybe a million dollars a year in research. Um, that's a lot more than than most um, grant makers at that at that level, uh, you know, commit to. Um, but then on the other hand, if if you're, um, you know, if if you're a twenty thousand dollar organization um, and you're trying to figure out how to do your programming better, sure, you know, figure out ways that you can that you can. Um, sort of structure things or do little things on the side to sort of reduce the uncertainty you have about, um, you know, the, the impact on your audiences or whatever. But, um, you know, I don't know that it's necessary to ensure that that particular organization is like, you know, changing people's lives necessarily. <laughs> Right. Well, I think I think a big part of it is um, is about sort of just vis like re lending visibility to the issues, right? Um, sort of naming the problem, you know, and that's that's part of what I'm trying to do with this. And and you know, as I was going through it, I was kind of thinking to myself, like, wow, that sound like a scold. Like, <laughs> um, but you know, I'm I'm what I'm trying to do is to sort of point out these problems because I don't see anyone else talking about them, and and I think that they really matter. Um, for our field, so you know, if we can, if we can start doing more of that, if we can have some of the research, uh, sorry, some of the communications infrastructure in place that we we're talking about to start bringing these things out into the open more, and um, you know, and talk about ways to possibly solve them, that eventually finds itself back into the bloodstream of decision makers, um, and you know, and, and their thought process and influences the conversation. Um, I've seen it happen before, and you know, so I'm not. I'm not super worried about that aspect of it, um, but I do think that um, you know th it's one thing for people to realize that there's a problem, and there's another, it's another thing for them to decide to act on it. And I think that's where it might um, might run into the bigger hurdle because you know, like I said, like for example, um, with the suggestion that I had about um, sort of spending more time reacting to other people's research. You know, there, right now there's just no reason for anybody to do that. Um, it's not in their self-interest to to take that time unless they're really just you know sort of intrinsically interested in having being a part of that conversation. Um, but it's not you know it doesn't it's it's not going to pay the bills in the same way. It's not going to sort of um, make a name for themselves. And so it's uh, um, you know, but if we were able to sort of change that by changing you know, what funders consider, for example, when deciding what to, what research to fund, then that could help, you know, so, sorry. Yeah? First of all, thanks, uh, really enjoyed the panel, good uh, super rich in, in a lot of ways, uh, has me thinking. Mm -hmm. um, but I guess, I guess a couple, like, fundamental things that I'm still trying to wrap my head around and, and see, 
uh, basically you review your project at one time building consensus about a certain research agenda. Mm -hmm. um, but you are, you're often referring to our field, and it's not clear to me what the field is. Um, you're, you're talking a lot about grants, which makes me think that you're only looking at non-profit organizations mm -hmm. as opposed to entertainment industry and so forth. Uh, at the same time, you, you could then say, well, uh, I mean, there, there are people studying non-profits and lots of, uh, and philanthropy in lots of different settings and healthcare and, and so forth. So, so, first of all, it would seem like we'd have to agree upon well, who's part of this, this field. Mm -hmm. um, and, and then it seems that you, you have to get them all to agree on the agenda mm -hmm. that indeed um, this the vibrancy of communities is the purpose of all arts. Mm -hmm. And then kind of what do you do with all the people who just say, well, I kind of like playing the piano and uh, people pay me to play the piano, so I'm going to work as an artist and, and perform or paint or what have you. Uh, mm -hmm. You you'd have to get everyone on board with the goals before you can convince them to get on, on board to be contributing to this fund of knowledge about how to get to those uh, goals. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'd just like to hear your thoughts about that. Yeah, uh, so the, the comment was about sort of, uh, I've talked a lot in this today about uh, the field without really defining what I mean by the field. And um, it's, a, it's, a, it's a really good point. And, um, and I'll preface this by saying that, uh, you know, a lot, of, a lot of the material that I, you know, kind of presented today is, is new for today um, and uh, you know these are thoughts for the most part that I've had um, or, or some of these thoughts um, that are being presented are quite recent um, so I really appreciate any sort of critical feedback that you guys have to kind of help me sort of refine um, a lot of this um, the uh, so so you're right um, the that sort of word has been sort of a catch-all for me, and I, I, um, uh, I, I suppose I do mean something more specific by it than what I've been saying. Um, I, I do think that nonprofits are uh, certainly a major focus, probably not the only focus, um, but that's sort of the world that um, that I'm accustomed to working in. Um, and I also. It's also the case that uh, I'm I'm really interested in grant making and in resource allocation and sort of the, you know, uh, I guess the science of it, if you will. It seems sort of pretentious, but but basically the craft of it um, and uh, the way, and particularly the way that research sort of connects with resource allocation. And and why am I, I interested in that? I think that it's because um, resources really represent power in a lot of ways. Um, and you know the uh, the way in which our there's there's a lot of talk all the time um, among um, people in the arts that there there are sort of unequal distributions of power within the field. Certain organizations have more power than others. You know, certain kinds of art might have more power than others. Um, they uh, you know, and there's um, there are a lot of conversations about um, cultural equity. For example, I'm really interested in how um, uh, how funders use the power that they have, which is undeniably a lot, um, to try and serve the greater good, which is what they're supposed to be doing. Um, and you know, I think that there's a lot of potential for research to help help us help them do that better, and help us encourage them to do that better, um, and help us do it better in our own work and lives as well. Um, so that's really sort of where I'm where I'm coming from with all of this, and who, and and I think why I talk a lot about funding in in this talk. Does that help? Does that make sense? Yeah. Uh, I'd, like, I'd like to talk a lot. Thank you very much. Uh, I guess I first say that uh, uh, I've heard this is the same. And this talk would have been given in 1999 when we had the first cultural policy center uh, event. Could have been given in 2001 when Pew, I think it was 2001, when Pew came out with their board of national, you know, cultural policy uh, agenda, which uh, a month later they, they they pulled back after getting uh, eviscerated by the right. So I, I mean, I'm, I, I'm feeling nostalgic uh, based on what you're saying, calling for sort of a field build, building 
uh, process. And mm -hmm. so, so mm -hmm. this is this is like the perennial siren song for us in, in, in arts halls. But I, I just want to ask you a quick question about <coughs> the Thai restaurant um, uh, illustration that you gave, and ask you if you were to produce a pro uh, research uh, 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 study that that showed that it would be better to spend money on a Thai restaurant in order to make the community more vibrant. Mm -hmm. That that would produce more uh, an impact on vibrancy than funding the modern dance company. Yeah. What would happen to that stuff? I mean, would you be allowed to do that stuff? So you're asking me sort of realistically, is your question about realistically sort of on the constraints that are pa placed upon me? Or are you asking what I would want to do with the I'm stuff? I'm asking is it about the constraints placed on uh -huh. by arts funders. Yeah. Uh, Right. Right. Whether the arts actually are the most efficient way to, to accomplish the goal, if the goal is no longer mm -hmm. to support mm -hmm. the arts, but mm -hmm. to create a more vibrant community. If it turns out the way right. to create a more vibrant community can be done without any arts at all. Yeah. So are they going to are they going to be willing to challenge that? So I think that the the sins that I'm talking about <laughs> in my talk are are more sins of omission than commission. Um, I don't think that, you know, I think if that study happened, I, I really doubt that, you know, somebody would like bury it, um, you know, or, or somehow prevent me from, from talking about it or, or anything like that. Um, it's not, you know, frankly, the, the arts sector is too decentralized to even make that possible. Um, uh, now, other, there are people in other jobs that might not be in that position that, you know, are, are um, you know, their, their job is to do the research that has been assigned to them and it's going to be what it is. But, um, you know, speaking of, about the field as a whole, uh, I'm not too worried about that. But, but I do think that what happens is that, you know, some funder or whatever, somebody, some nonprofit will say, well, let's look at how creative placemaking can contribute to vibrancy in the arts. And they'll, they'll never even think to suggest that we should be looking at restaurants too. Um, that happens all the time. And the, so in the ironic thing is that in academia, you, have, you ha have a lot more of that kind of inquiry where it's like looking at things across, you know, com making comparisons to other fields and so forth. But because of the, you know, the lack of communication between academia and the practitioner world, um, you know, that, that gets buried for a completely other reason, right? So I think it's I think the building blocks are there, but it's you know it's more just that it's it's sort of not in people's interest to ask the uncomfortable questions, and so they and so it just doesn't happen a lot of times. Um, but but actually, I really feel that it is in our long term interest to ask the um, ask the uncomfortable questions and ask them hard, and um, and pay attention to the results because ultimately, you know, if we're making claims about the arts. Um, and you know, sort of designing programs for them and so forth on the basis of something that just isn't true, um, or you know, is unreliable or doesn't hold water or whatever. It's going to come back to bite us eventually, you know. And we shouldn't we shouldn't be trying to pretend that things that what we do is more important than it actually is. <laughs> I really believe that. Um, and so you know, at the same time, we can we can. We should be ready and willing and eager to take credit for the things that we really should be taking credit for. Um, so, and I hope that we'll be able to do that. Those were my final comments. <laughs>